we had to close down. We couldn't operate. And people going up and down the street, police were with windows out of the, the police cars and shooting tear gas all over. We had to send people home and we didn't know what we're going to do. Uh, you know, so, so that was just the start of, of that rocky road. It was a, a, a line upward, but it was a zigzag line on almost everything that we did. Podcasting from Boulder, Colorado. This is the Baby Got Backstory podcast, where we dive into the story behind the story of today's most inspiring storytellers, creators, and entrepreneurs. I like big backstories, and I cannot lie. I am your host, Mark Gutman. I'm Mark Gutman, and on today's episode of Baby Got Backstory, how a kid from Spokane sold his family window business, moved to San Francisco, and founded one of the world's largest and most recognizable adventure brands. Now, if you like and enjoy the show, please take a minute or two to rate and review us over at iTunes. iTunes uses these as part of the algorithm that determines ratings on the Apple charts. And ratings help us to build an audience, which then helps us continue to produce this show. And lastly, this show is all about creating value for you, as well as opening up a dialogue. And I realize I often do all the talking, but please, let's have a two-way conversation. I am at Mark Gutman on all social channels, and you can always send me an email to podcast at wildstory.com with your thoughts and recommendations for the show. I am so excited for today's episode. There are a few brands that speak to us. We all have them. Brands that tell us who we are. Brands that are like guideposts representing moments in our lives. Brands that tell the story of our aspirations and who we want to be. And for me, the North Face is one of those brands. I have memories of reading National Geographic books by flashlight under the covers when I was supposed to be asleep. Stories of families that went backpacking. Mine did not, and I wanted to be in that family. Or of great explorers climbing granite walls and exploring in ways I only dreamed of. All clad in brightly colored puffy North Face coats, or hunkered down weathering ferocious storms in North Face tents. And today, we get to hear the story of how the North Face came to be and what it represents from founder and former CEO, Hap Klopp. Hap is an incredible individual, and once you hear his story, it is clear that he was destined to build a great brand. And this is his story. Well, pretty much so. I, I, Mark, I was born and, and raised in Spokane, Washington. And in Spokane, there aren't a lot of things to do other than go to the outdoors. It isn't like it's in the center of a big metropolitan city or whatever. So it was a natural part of growing up that I was constantly out hiking or I was you know, fishing or I was, uh, you know, boating or, or doing whatever. And it was something which just uh, was very comfortable. And when I ultimately decided that I didn't fit into the corporate world, uh, because I didn't like all the things that were going on in the corporate world, I decided that if I started a business around something I knew and cared about, that it was going to be the best path for me. And that was ultimately the inspiration. It was kind of a combination of desperation because I didn't fit into the real world and <laughs> and uh, opportunity because I really loved that and loved the people who were involved in, in the outdoor world. Did you have a, a moment when you can recall and you, and you can look back to that day when you realized you did not fit into corporate America? Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I had actually, my father died when I was in, uh, college. I went to Stanford, and in my last year at Stanford, uh, he died. And we had a family company in Spokane that made wood windows, frames, sash, and door. And so I was charged with running the company and going to school at the same time. And I, I did that uh, probably uh, not as good as anybody uh, could have been full time, and not as good as somebody who's more experienced. But I was the one that was charged to do that. I concluded as I went through and studied the company and the industry, that we weren't big enough to be competitive. Uh, We were uh, far away from the timber. We were going to have to move the plant to do that, to be able to be competitive. We're going to have to raise millions of dollars. And all that sounded kind of daunting for a 20-year-old. So 
what I did was just that I'd sell the company and I applied at the same time to go back and get an MBA at Stanford. And so during my first year at Stanford in the MBA program, I was uh, trying to be a student. I was trying to run the company and I was trying to sell the company. And about the only thing I was good at was drinking beer, but that, uh, <laughs> that was what I did. And I fortunately sold the company at the end of the, of that first year. But, uh, and so it's a two year program. And I was thinking that I should then find somebody who'd want me to run their company because I liked running companies. I'd done it and I was going to have a Stanford MBA, but as it turned out, nobody offered me that. And I, I was matching that up with the fact that while I was getting my MBA and looking at a lot of large businesses and while I was studying our own family company and trying to figure out, there were so many things that just didn't resonate with me. First of all, I didn't believe in planned obsolescence, and that was kind of the nature of the day at that time. I didn't believe in paying women half of what men were paid. I couldn't understand why there was discrimination based on sexual preference or whatever, or on language, people, immigrants coming in, because I thought you just needed the best people around you to build a great company. And you know, so all of those things were that way. And so uh, because nobody offered me a job, I finally decided I'd kind of cave in and look at working for a large company and maybe on the side look for something for myself. Uh, I didn't feel comfortable with that because I'm always 120% in on everything I do. And that sort of smacked to being you know, 80% in on the company and 20% on my own behalf or whatever. And that, that wasn't right. And, and also it was kind of throwing myself into the same place where uh, all these ideas didn't resonate. Well, uh, I was invited to a number of places and I focused on consumer goods because I thought I had a flair for branding and sales and, and marketing. And so I ended up with an interview, uh, many of them, but an interview at Procter & Gamble. And that was the one that sealed the deal. They invited me back to Cincinnati, which is their headquarters. Here I am coming from the fast pace of the Bay Area, what's now Silicon Valley and everything moving quickly. And I end up in, in Cincinnati. And the old joke about Cincinnati is that if I'm going to die, I want to die in Cincinnati because everything happens two years later there. Well, the, <laughs> the reality was I got into the interview. The interview was eight hours, an hour each with eight different people. And the, uh, the first hour is with the HR department. At that point, he said, you know, is your name Kenneth or is it Hap? And I said, well, could be either one, but most of my friends call me Hap. He said, well, when you work here, it'll be Kenneth because you, know, you don't get the gravitas necessary to manage older people if you have nicknames. And I took that in advisement. And then he said, in the same vein, you should be wearing a white shirt and a tie. It really pissed me off because I was wearing a white shirt and a tie. And there's no productivity analysis that will show you white shirts get you any more productivity. So I, uh, at this point, I know I'm in the wrong place. And he asked that question that's always asked uh, by these interviewers. And he said, if you were to join our organization, you know, looking up at the skies of communing with God, he said, if you were to join our organization, where do you envision you'd be in five years? And I said, if, and I'd like to underscore the word if, I were to join Procter & Gamble, I'd expect to be president in five years. And that means passing you in about five minutes, but I don't think that's any big deal. Strange thing is they offered me a job, but, but it, that was the moment in answer to your question where I knew I had to do something else. And I knew that I really couldn't work for anybody else because I was too idiosyncratic, not only in my thinking, but also in my, my ways and the hubris that I had. It just wasn't going to work. And so what I knew was I had to do something which I was going to run on my own and either rise or fall on my ideas. And and so to clarify, you, you didn't take that job, did you, or or did you take that job? No, I didn't take that job, and and they would have been fools to take me, even though they offered me one. Yeah, and so looking back, I mean, there's there's so many interesting things to happen. Thank you for for sharing all that. But like, where do you think you get that sense that it sounds to me in the short time that we've been talking that you have a very clear sense of right and wrong. You have very strong values. Things like no planned obsolescence, obsolescence, equality in the workplace. Hey, the best workers, I don't care what you're wearing. Just give me the best work. Where do you think that comes from? Well, you know, one, you grow up in a, in a family that had a business, a family business. So uh, I was around it all the time. And my parents, I think, were strong influences. They believed that business could do good and, and uh, they were much more conservative than I turned out to be. But nonetheless, 
we were quite similar in that thinking. I, I think it started there. Uh, I also, when I was in school, they'd have me work at every job possible in the factory, whether it was loading lumber or timber or boxcars or uh, putting things into sawmill. And you end up working with people from a lot of walks of life. And it's quite a learning experience. You know, you might uh, think you're smarter than they are, and then you work beside them for a little bit and suddenly realize, boy, they know a lot of things you don't. And so, so some of that was there. And then, then I, I was very lucky in terms of my education that uh, people took care of me and sort of steward me towards what I was going to be. I didn't realize at that time that's what they were doing, but, uh, you know, it led to where I was going to be. I, you know, I tried to make money when I was very young. So one of the things I did was actually go out hunting for gophers and I would hunt gophers and then cut off the tails and sell the tails to people making flies for fly fishing and got to know a number of fly fishing people and whatever. But, uh, you know, it was kind of a small business. In fact, kind of, it was really small. And then when I was in school, when I was in grade school, I, from the fifth grade on, they had me just finish my schooling at, at noon, and then I could go do other things. I'd play sports in the afternoon. Uh, I would ended up running a school store that they had me manage right out in front of the uh, the principal's office, interestingly, and they had me doing a lot of directed reading. I would do reading on my own, and it, it was, you know, things like Kant and Marx and Hegel and, and whatever. I didn't understand it very much, but they were trying to stretch my mind. They were trying to give me something to do. I mean, later on, and particularly as I teach, which I do now, I recognize the signs of, of, <laughs> of ADD or something, and I suspect that what I was was very disruptive, but instead of uh, coming down on me for being disruptive, they found things for me to do that allowed me, one, to build my own self-confidence, develop my own philosophies, to test some business ideas, uh, try to extend my athletic activities, and made me very proud of, of what I did, and in such a way that I formed my own cheering squad. I didn't need outsiders necessarily to measure what I was doing as much as I, I just needed to stand up to my own principles. Yeah, and so what kind of student were you? You know, giving us that background was it was it, was school hard for you? No, school was easy. I, I had a good propensity for memorizing things. I don't know that necessarily means you learn it, but I could memorize things pretty well, so I could get through that. And I ended up working, uh, I think, less than a lot of people in class to be able to get the grades I had. People pushed me to be able to improve on it, but, uh, you know, I'd, I would memorize and get through it. You know, I'd study the, the, when I got to high school and then college, I'd study the teacher and figure out the questions the teacher was going to ask, and then that was all I studied. So it was more psyching out the teachers than anything else. And I remember one example of that. I was in the geometry class, and the, the, we had quizzes every day, and so I turned in the quizzes. And at the top of my quiz, every day I'd put an A or an A plus or whatever. And finally, about halfway through the class, the teacher called me in and he said, I know what you're doing. I know what you're doing. You're brainwashing me. I said, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to save you the work. I know it's going to be an A, so uh, just saving the work for doing it. But <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and so at, at that age, like, what did you want to do with your life in, in high school? Did you know? I wanted to have fun. And I wanted to do things my way. You know, I, I didn't define it in terms I want to be in the outdoor business or I didn't define it that I was going to be something. I suspected I was going to end up in the business world because of my background, because I seemed to have an affinity for it. But, but it was more in direction and maybe it was as much running away from things I didn't like, like the things I enumerated before, that it, my feeling was the world wasn't going the way I wanted it too. And I thought that maybe an individual such as myself could do a small part about changing it. Yeah. And that's, that's pretty uh, insightful. I remember when I was in high school, I wasn't really thinking much about anything, including the world. I was, I was on my own track of, Hey, you know, you go to school, you go to college, kind of figure it out. And you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And that's where I really discovered my love for the outdoors. And, you know, in college was my first uh, kind of brush and experience with the North Face and, and it was very kind of influential time for me, but I, I had no idea. So to think that at, at that age that you even were aware of the world around you and that you could make a difference, that's pretty impressive. 
Well, you know, I don't know if it's impressive. Some of it I said was running away from things. It, it turned out, when I, you know, I really wanted to be a, an athlete uh, that I love sport and outdoor. And I was a fair football player in high school and tennis player and whatever. So I had this dream that I was going to go play football in college. And I had a couple of scholarships, but uh, they they weren't to very well-known schools and not very big. And my father had gone to MIT and he was a recruiter for the Northwest for MIT. So he decided he would uh, get me to go back to MIT and fall in love with it just as much as, as he had. So he took me back there and he introduced me to three very famous people, Werner von Braun, Glenn Seaborg, and somebody else. And these are people who had just come over from Germany. I could hardly understand their, their, what they were saying because of their accent. And then when I did understand it, I didn't have a clue what they were talking about. And it's like, I came back from that and I said, you know, I'm totally intimidated. I, I couldn't possibly go there, Dad. I, there's no way in the world I would survive. I'm, I'm not smart enough. I'm not quick enough. I'm not, I'm not an engineer. I'm, I'm not those things. And he said, well, you, you may, you know, I understand what you're doing. I'd love to have you go there. But if you're not going to go there, then you, you've got to go somewhere other than these football scholarships you're looking at because you're never going to be a, a great football player. You're not big enough. You're not tall enough. And, and, you know, so you have to find a good school. Well, this was like, I don't know, February of, of my senior year. And so out of desperation, I applied to Stanford. And, and fortunately, I knew the football coach at Stanford uh, there, and he'd seen me because he'd been uh, at Washington State, which was near Spokane. And so he, uh, he greased the wheels so that I could actually get into the university in about 15, 20 days. And I did. And that's how I found my way to Stanford. <laughs> well, that's, that's, it's always good to, to have connections for sure. And so you went to Stanford. Uh, it sounds like you had a, a great experience there. Was there anything that was a standout moment from your time at Stanford that really contributed or lent itself to either increasing, uh, you know, your passion for the outdoors or, or even, uh, or brand building, you know, you did mention that you, you thought you had a affinity for marketing and branding and that, you know, did you learn that at, uh, Stanford or was that later in life? Well, you know, some of it was there. It turned out there, there are a couple of epiphanies I had there, but one of them, uh, one of my fraternity brothers, their father, uh, was Dick Solomon. And Dick was a founder of Lan Van Charles Loretz Cosmetics, also uh, uh, managed Yves Saint Laurent and uh, Vidal Sassoon. And so um, I visited his family and his, and his father, and they ultimately became one of the first investors in North Face. And Dick Solomon became our first chairman. Uh, so it did lead to understanding it. Dick didn't know anything about the outdoors, but he knew a lot about branding and just uh, the, the gems that he imparted when I had the, the time to talk with him, I think were very helpful in me being able to do it. But on a, on a lighter note, I think the epiphany that I had about there is I, I didn't know if I really fit in at Stanford because it turned out I, I wasn't good enough to stay on the football team. The guy who was ahead of me ended up going to the NFL, Steve Thurlow played with the Giants for a couple of years. So I had to, to transition out of that and out of uh, sort of luck. I transferred into the wrestling program. I'd never wrestled before, but I wrestled for two years there and ended up third on the coast in my weight class. So, you know, but it was there, but I was going, okay. And, you know, I, I wasn't sure I wanted to be an engineer. I wasn't, I, so I decided to one, set up my own major. I didn't like the majors as they were constructed. I was just interested in a lot of things. And it took me going through 15 advisors, but finally, uh, I got one to agree that I could write my own major, and that major w was everything. I was art history. It had to do with studying the uh, moon landing that was going to happen, astronauts coming in and speaking. It was industrial economics. It was uh, all sorts of things to that line. Uh, I then had to name it, and I decided when I was going to apply for business school that I would call it. Uh, something that sounded business-like, so I called it executive management. And with that executive management, I was the first person to get that degree. <laughs> Does that uh, program or that degree still exist today? I don't know. They certainly allow people now to carve their own uh, uh, major and do it. It's within some tracks that they have, like science and technology and whatever. I've got a grandson going there right now. He's the soccer player there. And uh, I don't know what he's going to do, but hopefully he will do a little bit more in terms of a narrowed track than I had. But I, eclectic would be probably what I thought about. 
<laughs> and so let's go back. So you're, you're leaving that job out of interview out of Cincinnati, out of uh, Procter and Gamble. You're like, this is not for me. This is corporate America. Not for me. Head back to San Francisco. About what year is that? Uh, well, I came back after my MBA, which was in 66. I finished that 67, did some consulting while I developed a business plan for going into the outdoor business. There were a couple of companies around and I had the idea that what I really wanted to do was probably get something that existed that would provide cash flow while I was developing new products because my concept was to disrupt the entire industry, to create materials or take materials that didn't exist, materials from the Vietnam War, as it turns out, and disrupt the general camping business. Because the camping that I'd done and the camping that people were doing at that time required using very heavy products like sleeping bags and, uh, and tents and packs, all made out of uh, very heavy materials. By converting them, by using these space-age materials, used aircraft aluminum, uh, it came from the, from the war effort in Vietnam, but I made tent poles and pack frames out of them. I took things such as parachute cloth, made sleeping bags and, and tent tops and some funky clothing. But in doing all of that, the net result was that it came up with a product that was about 50% lighter than anything on the marketplace. And I knew that was going to facilitate what I wanted to do and what a lot of my friends wanted to do, which was going a lot further into the wilderness without it being a beast of burden act. Yeah. So like it's, it's roughly 66. I mean, what does the outdoor industry, if there even is one look like at that time? I mean, it's, you know, today it's like robust and we have all these, you know, and it's really crossed over. Not just, it's not just the outdoor industry. A lot of outdoor uh, companies such as the North Face and, and similar companies are also in our everyday American culture. I mean, they're not, they're a lifestyle brands, not just outdoor brands. And so, but at, at that time, at that time, like what's the outdoor space look like? Cause I can't believe that it's looking really like this amazing business opportunity. Well, it was a camping business then. The, the one we started out with, you know, the North Face now is involved in all sorts of fashion, as you mentioned, uh, and in a lot of allied fields, whether it's running or hiking or, or biking or, or whatever. But it, at the time, we wanted to develop a camping company. And there were companies, Coleman had been there for a long time. Wenzel was a tent company, had been around. But they were all very heavy. The packs, there was one that REI had at that time, uh, and I have a sample of it still, but it basically it was a wood frame with canvas duck material on the outside. Very heavy, didn't move very easily. It was restrictive when you walk. The, you know, the sleeping bags were four and a half, five pounds. And so between your pack and your bag, you're already carrying 10, 12 pounds uh, without even uh, going anywhere, without food, without uh, clothing in there. So the idea was to disrupt the camping business we didn't realize at that time that it was going to create a whole new segment. That whole new segment was what became known as a backpacking business. And in fact, we argued for about a year and a half about whether or not we should really call it backpacking. People were starting to call it that, but we said, you know, that sounds like too much work. So we tried to come up with a name like pleasure packing and uh, that didn't stick. So finally we went back to backpacking and, and we did it. But the, the idea was to build a brand from day one. And I believed in building a brand. And the way you build a brand is effectively, or the way I teach it now, and I, I consult companies uh, specifically on branding, but also on other things, strategy and what have you. But the branding idea is to find three words that define the DNA of who you are and make sure they cut across every aspect of your company, not just your product, but also the, your service, your business model, your employees, everybody you touch. And those three words must be consistent over time. And then like coral, it grows very slowly. People can't see that happening, but it becomes very intricate and so unique that you almost have a monopoly. Our three words were disruption, quality, and triple bottom line. And this disruption, of course, I mentioned the product, but it was also our business model. We were omni-channel from day one. We sold in our own catalog, we sold in our own stores, and we actually sold wholesale. At that time, it was considered heresy. Now it's pretty much the norm. But uh, we did that. We were constantly disrupting our first company to install an ESOP program when we existed there. Uh, so 
we would do that. We'd find stories to tell about it. So our community would talk about it and thereby uh, spread the word and it was more credibility than we told it ourselves. In terms of quality, as I mentioned earlier, I didn't believe in, Trump, in the cons- product obsolescence. So what we did was create a product that will last for a lifetime. And we put a lifetime warranty on it, which was quite a story. Uh, and that lifetime warranty, of course, told everybody involved what we stood for, whether it was vendors providing us materials, whether it was employees working for us, whether it was people selling our product, whether it was our customers, it defined that. And that was kind of the story we had, but lifetime warranty. And then triple bottom line basically refers to people, profit, and planets, or an equal emphasis on the environment, on society, and on building a good business. And from that standpoint, we never hired anybody, I never hired anybody at the outset that had any business training. I hired people that were passionate and they were brilliant, but they were passionate either about the outdoors or about changing the world because we believed what we were doing would change the world. We subscribed to Thoreau's comment that in the wilderness is the preservation of the world. And we believe that because we'd been there, we did that, we knew that the urban problems that existed like the Vietnam War at that time, and, and whatever, uh, was not where the future was. And we believe we could facilitate people going there. So we had a high level of, of interest in doing that. Well, even though none of the people had business training, as I said, they were all brilliant, 11 of those went on to run or start other companies that were in the outdoors. Uh, Jack Gilbert uh, went on to found Mountain Hardware. Sally McCoy ended up running Birkenstock. And some others, Bill Worland ran Patagonia's international operation. Missy Park started a company called Title IX, Women's Competitive Athletic. So, so we were able to, one, focus on profits. We were able to do that. But then we institu- instituted some of the idiosyncratic ideas I had. We spoke 11 languages at all times. So anybody could immediately come into our company and work there if they were a great employee. We paid women the same as men. We didn't care if somebody was gay or lesbian or transgender. We hired the best people, and that worked. We believed in the environment. And in the environment, first of all, it was easy to explain to people that if you believe in the environment, if you're selling products to go out into the wilderness, you want to preserve the environment. But the reality is we had a bigger dream than that and what we were doing. And the way we finally got that across, because I was afraid that preaching too much about the environment, maybe was going to get resistance and and not get the desired effect. We came up with a unique way to be able to promote our environmental view. I call it jujitsu, but basically what we did is create a negative award. And that negative award was based on Kurt Vonnegut's writing in The Cat's Cradle, in that the protagonist is this inventor who has an invention that's going to turn all of the water in the world into ice. Now, of course, that's going to destroy the world, but he has to keep going because it's such a great invention. Well, in his honor, and in, in Vonnegut's honor, what we did is create the Ice Nine Award. That was the name of what he was producing. And we awarded it each year to the most environmentally destructive individual organization uh, that we'd come across. Even gave it to the U.S. Congress one year and plenty of feedback from all their aides and what have you. But, but through doing that, we were able to make our environmental statement. Wow. And then so... You know, you, you mentioned a lot of different uh, authors like uh, Vonnegut and Thoreau. And, you know, what, what place does the literature have for you? It seems to have a, a big connection in, in, in your worldview. Well, I, I read a lot and I like reading. And, you know, maybe that was facilitated, as I said, in grade school. When, instead of being in class, they were giving me books to read outside of class. Uh, but, but I've always enjoyed that. I've, I've written two books. I wrote one on success called Conquering the North Face. I wrote another one on failure of a Silicon Valley company that I was involved with. That was called Almost. Uh, and, you know, I've written 11 books of poetry that I've inflicted on my family, but not the public uh, yet. And I've written three children's books each time I had a grandchild. So, yeah, I, I enjoyed that. Uh, you see a lot of things. I, I enjoy writers. I had the good pleasure at Stanford. I'd have a, a number of, of friends there who are in the writing community, English majors, but also creative writing uh, that inspired me. This episode brought to you by Wild Story. Wait, isn't that your company? It is. And without the generous support of Wild Story, this show would not be possible. 
A brand isn't a logo or a tagline or even your product. A brand is a person's gut feeling about a product, service, or company. It's what people say about you when you're not in the room. Wild Story helps progressive founders and savvy marketers build purpose-driven brands that connect their business goals with the customers they want to serve so that both the business and the customer needs are met. This results in crazy, happy, loyal customers that purchase again and again, and this is great for business. If that sounds like something you and your team might want to learn more about, reach out at www.wildstory.com, and we'd be happy to tell you more. Now back to our show. Yeah, and so I I keep thinking back to, you know, you, you were talking about how you were inspired to create lighter uh, gear, things that could help you get further back. I mean, was there a moment, like, what was it like back then? Were you going out and exploring and going on expeditions and just finding that you couldn't get for far enough? Like, what was going on for you? And was there a moment when, and you've also used a collective we, and I don't know, or actually, you've used a we, I don't know if it's a collective we, or when you're saying we started this, we got this going. Were you out with a a partner and, and you said, look, we, we got to do something different here? Well, I had a number of partners, really, when you look at it and brought it in. But Jack Gilbert was one at the outset that I came up with the idea. And then Jack uh, said, well, he wanted to buy into it. I brought him him into the company uh, actually at the same time that I went because we took over two stores, stores that have been founded by Doug Tompkins. They were primarily ski stores and they're only about 300,000 in total volume, but they had a great image, great name. And as I said, we needed Safeway money. We needed some cash flow coming in because we knew when we were creating revolutionary products, disruptive products, that it was going to take a while for them to be understood, accepted by other people. So we were going to push it ourselves. So anyway, Jack Jack joined in there and others came along. But we always tried to operate it as a team. There, there was a, a great saying from Lao Tzu, which is, you know, the evil leader is the one who... who uh, leads through fear. Uh, the, the good leader is one who leads through people uh, admiring. The great leader is the one who, when they're through, everybody said, I did it myself. And that was the strategy that I had that I tried to implement at North Face. Yeah. And so it sounds like it started off primarily, did it start off as a retail operation? Was that yes. the, the genesis? And then where does the name the North Face come from? The North Face uh, is from the North Face of the Iger Mountain. People who are climbers generally know that in the Northern Hemisphere, the most dangerous route is almost always on the North Face because that's where ice collects and what have you. So it, the name was chosen by Doug Tompkins and, and it fit well, but because it was known by climbers, the people who are influencers in our world, and it really meant something to them, but it was also a very simple name that anybody in the general populace could remember and pick up and, and state. So it served that dual purpose and not a lot of brand names that actually do that. Yeah. And so what, what, what does that name mean to you? Well, now it means everything that we put 20 plus years while well, I ran it into it. It means the people, it means the ideas, it means revolution, it means a brand. But uh, going back, uh, you asked the question, was I going out in these super expeditions? I wasn't the one that went to the extremes on doing that. I had shot catalogs and we went down the Zambezi River, some of the first to do that. We went into the mountains, we went to Nepal, we did, went to Switzerland climbing. But uh, when you're running a business and with the skills that I had, they were more business suited than that. You don't spend six months a year generally out doing those. So what we had to do in the we that you talked about is bring in a group of people who are our friends who would spend six months or maybe nine months a year out doing things, whether it was climbing mountains, forging rivers, whether it was one person rode from the tip of South America to the Antarctic, Ned Gillette. Uh, we had other people who were doing the first crossing of the St. Elias region, uh, others who were the first on Everest uh, in some cases. And so what we did is collect that community. We used them both as influencers and athletes, influencing outside and inside because they helped us define our product. They helped us test our product. They would come back with that and uh, we would then gain from, from actual real use and extreme conditions. Yeah. And so, and help me understand. So it sounds like 
what happened was you, you started the business. You had a business plan, but you acquired some retail, uh, mm-hmm. two stores, the North Face in, in, in San Francisco. And then you start to develop your own product. What does that look like? I mean, is it like right away? Is it a success? Like are people, you know, clamoring for it? You know, what was that? What was that like for you? Well, it depends how you define success. If you define success of coming up with some great products that really were revolutionary. Yeah, we did that. We did that within the first few weeks that I got things done. The success from an acceptance standpoint in the marketplace uh, was harder. When we went out, uh, Jack was the one that went out trying to sell, and he went around the whole West Coast calling on sporting goods stores and was able to get one order for 14 sleeping bags. And that was after three weeks on the road trying to sell things. But in our own stores, it was selling very well. I wouldn't say like hotcakes, but very well. And those initially were sleeping bags and packs. Rather quickly, we ended up getting into uh, tents, and then we got into sleep and uh, clothing. And we did a lot of that because when you have a lifetime product, one of the challenges you have is how do you sell more of them? If somebody bought a sleeping bag from us and they're happy, they wouldn't grow very rapidly because they wouldn't be coming back. So we were relying on them to tell their friends. But then we said, well, what else could we do to grow? And one is if they're satisfied, give them another range of product, not a replacement product, but something that would augment their kit. Yeah. And so you're selling, I mean, what is the the early growth of the company look like? Well, we, when I took over from Doug, the retail stores were doing 300,000. Next year we did 600,000. The year after that, we did a million two. Then we did two six. Uh, then we got up to about 6 million or so. So it, it was, we thought it was rapid growth in today's world of, of unicorns and things. People would scoff at that, but it, in turn, when you bring in a bunch of people that are entirely new, you almost double your workforce every year. Uh, you're trying to educate people on business norms and, and philosophy and, and qualitative goals. That, there was a lot to do while we were doing that. Yeah, well, six million uh, sounds like just around pre-1970 or right around 1970 is quite a bit of money and, and, and a lot more than it may sound today for business growth. I mean, what, what's going on there? So you still have two retail locations at that time, and then you're selling catalog? Uh, we actually had three, because what we did was ex- expand one store where the front of the store that was in Berkeley, the front of the store was retail, and the back was our manufacturing. And we did that. We told people we did it because we wanted it to be closer to the customer, have the customer see what we were doing, and we could hear them. Uh, that was half the truth, but the other half was it lowered our rent uh, to be able to have the two combined. Yeah, and then, so it sounds like things are going great. Does it ever get difficult at that time? It always gets difficult. You're on the, in a small business, any business, you're on the razor's edge between huge fame and success and abject failure. And it, it all depends on cash flow, the external conditions in the marketplace or whatever. And we started out in, in 68, doing that in 1969. Uh, the People's Park riots happened. They were across the street from, from where our Berkeley store was. We had to close down. We couldn't operate. And people going up and down the street, police were with windows out of the, the police cars and shooting tear gas all over. We had to send people home and we didn't know what we're going to do. Uh, so, so that was just the start of, of that rocky road. It was a, a, a line upward, but it was a zigzag line on almost everything that we did. Yeah. And, and so like, I'm sure there, you know, and, and you just mentioned it was always hard. You're trying to be an innovator. You're not, it's impossible to hit hundred percent home runs, uh, mm-hmm. when you're bringing out new product. Like what was, did, did you have a big failure or, or something that uh, almost sunk the ship? I don't know that we had big failures, but we had a lot of failures. I mean, I've, I've got a closet that will prove that to you. And, and it seemed like every time I thought something was great, that was almost a kiss of death. Uh, you know, it was other people that somehow could define it better than I could. When you try to impose your own view on the world, maybe uh, that's not right. You got to listen to the world more than what we were doing. But, you know, we'd introduced that. Some were very successful, some weren't. Uh, Some ideas, we tried to build the business in unique ways. We ended up with a problem, which was all of our sales were geared towards the summer because that's when most people wanted to go backpacking. They didn't really want to do snow camping. So we had to solve that. And I figured out a way with one of our employees uh, to invent uh, for the West Coast cross-country skiing. We took 
he had a contact with Johannes von Trapp, with the von Trapp family uh, back in Stowe, Vermont. They had cross-country skiing going there, which they really brought over from Germany, Austria. And so we brought some of his people out and we set up an entire program to build the winter business, then handed it off to the Yosemite people, but maintained a real close relationship with them. But that was a way to build the winter business and get people out there. Uh, other than that, we were totally out of balance from a cash flow standpoint, from a production standpoint or whatever. It never did exactly get balanced. And then it ended up being flipped because when you started selling jackets in the way the company does now, the jackets are 90% of the, of the sales, the hard goods, as we called it, is a much lesser percentage. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everyone's just wearing jackets with the, the North Face logo now and, and, and being really aspirational about a lot of times about uh, thinking that they're experiencing that, uh, that hard good experience. But uh, yep. I'm sure it wasn't like, you know, you had to build that brand to get there. So you ran the business for about 20 years. Is, is that correct? correct? That's correct. You know, the founder and CEO. And, and then what happens? Well, then it sold the company. And the reason I sold the company was that growing at the rate we were growing, we had to constantly refinance the company, which ended up meaning bringing in external investors for equity and also banks and constantly changing that. And that always challenges, particularly when you have very firmly set ideas of how you should run something. Every time you bring an equity partner on, you have to listen to them. So now I'm spending all my time uh, with people. I'm, I'm an investment banker. I'm a psychology counselor with outside people. And that wasn't why I'd actually came into the business. I came to the business because I love the outdoors. I came into the business because I love the people who work there. I came into the business because I loved educating people on, on how they could become business people. But I was you know, hardly doing that because I was spending at least six months a year doing those other activities. And, and constantly, you know, it was friction there. It wasn't as much fun. So I decided that what I should do is go skiing which I sold the company and did go skiing for a bit, but then got involved in a lot of other things because I'm, as I said, I have ADD or something. So I ended up, I have a consulting company that I ran since I sold the company and it works on strategy, brand, and, and uh, marketing in particular to help companies, both small and large. I wrote books, as I mentioned, I'd be able to do things. I do speaking around the globe on, on various things, including disruption and innovation. And I have ended up over the last seven years, eight years, teaching at various universities, doing adjunct teaching at, at Cal, a little bit at Stanford and Carnegie Mellon, and then uh, a full-time program that I have at Holt University, which has campuses in Dubai and London, Boston, San Francisco, and Shanghai, and uh, try to help them out there. And then I... Uh, mentor some of my students on their projects, and I serve on on uh, three boards right now. One board, a company called Kakona out of Boulder, which makes nanoparticles that are applied to fabrics and fibers to be able to change the functional properties of what's there. Uh, another one is a company that was in data visualization, digital marketing that did projections, marketing projections on things like the Empire State Building and the Grand Mosque of Abu Dhabi and the Sydney Opera House and a, a wall of computers that basically is like minority report. And so serving a few companies like that, the common thread on them is they're all growing, growing fast, and they're also disruptive because disruption plays out, in my view, in the same way. You can use brand as a way to overcome some of that. You also need to figure out how to finance it, how to grow it. So I try to keep busy. And then, you know, I've got... Uh, all sorts of sport activities that I still keep involved in because that's what keeps me sane. <laughs> it sounds like you are definitely, definitely busy, but like was selling the North Face, was that, was that a hard decision? Was that something you wrestled with and do you, do you miss it? Uh, no, no. Uh, thank heavens. They're doing a good job of managing it uh, right now. It's owned by the VF Corporation. Uh, I, I think I would have difficult time if they weren't stewarding it as well as they are uh, because, you know, you always say, I, I could do it better. I couldn't do it better. I mean, they're a $3 billion company now and that's a lot of meetings and things. And I'm not the type of person to be in meetings all the time, but uh, it, it, it was not as difficult as I thought to sell it, partly because the, at the end there, there was so much I was doing that I didn't like so much friction associated with that, uh, that, uh, you know, it was time to move on. The other thing was that 
I know there's lots of strategies for running businesses, but you could only use one strategy in, in one business. And so while I adhered to that at the North Face, I had a lot of other ways of looking at businesses that I wanted to employ, but I needed another company, another uh, way to be able to implement those. And so like, what was, in your opinion, the hardest part about about founding and then r- successfully running the North Face? Well, certainly fundraising because we were growing too fast and you can only, in the business the way it was constructed, you could only grow 20% a year on internally generated funds. So that meant that you're spending a lot of time doing that. The, the second thing that was challenging was really the amount of time necessary to be able to get everybody on the same page. Because if you're going to develop a singular iconic brand, as you use your term, uh, the way you do that is consistency of everybody in the company. And the only way that comes about, if you're doubling your, your staff and bringing new people in all the time, is by having regular meetings where you sit down and talk about the not only the quantitative goals, but the qualitative goals of the company. And that there's a lot of time spent doing that. And obviously not everybody picked up on it. Some people still wanted to do it their own way. And so we'd have long range planning meetings every two years. And at the end of the meeting, I would end with the same thing, which sounded old to the people been around, but novel to the people who were there new, because I'd say, I hope we're now clear enough that some of you leave the company. And the reason I say that is not because you aren't great employees, we hired you because you're great. But what I'm saying that is that if you have different ideas and can't wait to try to weigh in when it's going to be the next time two years from now, you should go someplace else where they embrace your ideas. We'll help you go there so that you aren't fighting us. You know, there isn't friction accomplishing that. You know, so that meant we changed some people and some people left and actually came back. Uh, some people left and tried to come up with other great ideas with other companies operating with different business models, uh, different positioning. Uh, all of that was good. But that that was hard because you invest a lot in your people and, and then you don't want to lose your people. You know, you, you have great ideas and, and how do you affect them? Uh, one of the stories, and it's a little bit lengthy, but if you hold with me, I'll try and tell you. Our, our big challenge at one point came when when the amount of goose down, which was our primary material for our sleeping bags and our jackets, it was the best material available, became limited in supply. And as a result of that, the middlemen, the people who were processing the down, started mixing in reused bedding down, inferior down, dust, feathers, and the quality was going down. And we were faced with the position that we always said quality is what we're going to be and we're going to make the best. Were we going to change what we stood for or were we going to come up with another solution? And I decided we couldn't change what we stood for because that was what our brand was about. So then we were faced with how do we get good quality down? We know there isn't enough out there. We know these people are bastardizing it. And what we decided to do and what I decided to do was go to China to jump the supply line uh, to be able to buy ahead of the people who are providing us so we could do that on our own. Now, that meant there were a lot of problems. The first one, that was 1975, and very few Americans had been into China, uh, probably in five or six or seven. That was after Kissinger and John Service and John Davies were there. Uh, So we had to get invited, which we did, and I got invited over there. Jack Gilbert and I went in to be able to negotiate. The second thing was that it meant we had to do business. If we could convince them, and there wasn't enough down, so we had to convince them, but if we could convince them, then we, we had to figure out how to finance it, which meant you buy the raw material, you process it. So we had to buy like a million dollars of raw material. And our bank, Bank of America, didn't deal with that. So we had to get a correspondent bank, which was BNP in Hong Kong. So they shipped the money to BNP and BNP shipped it to the central uh, Beijing chapter of the Native Animal Byproduct Company. And in turn, they shipped the money out to the provinces where the down was shipped from. So we were borrowing a million dollars to get a product that maybe was going to show up from a place where the the, or the country had not had done business with them and uh, do that. And we were able to accomplish it. The challenge, of course, is that the people that we needed to process the down from its raw state into a finished down were the same people that I was jumping over to get the down. But I guess that they would, because they were fighting so hard to make money, that they would process it for us. They ended up doing that, so we paid them. 
and uh, were able to maintain and, and have the highest quality down when everybody else was faced with with a bastardized product. Mm. I love that story of uh, innovation and sticking to your values and letting your values guide you uh, and guide the brand and, and, and not compromising. I mean, I think that that's yeah. always what you know, really maintains strong brand and what we expect as, as consumers. So, you know, understanding that how that works from a, a company perspective is extremely valuable. So Hap, what's one common myth about the North Face that you'd like to dispel? Well, today's common myth is it's a jacket company. And if you ask 80% of the marketplace out there, uh, they're quite satisfied that they see it in the city. That's an urban product. Uh, when in fact, we're basically a backpacking mountaineering company. That's what we were. That's still at the heart of the DNA of what happens out there. And even though the sales may have tilted uh, to the clothing or whatever, everything that North Face makes is designed for function, not designed for fashion. The fact that fashion has come our way, and not only our way, but also companies like Patagonia, Marmot, you name it, all, all the great brands out there, we didn't actually chase the market for fashion. We just basically said, we're here, we'd make it the right way. And then suddenly people started thinking, yes, form follows function. You know, this is a, a good way. This is what we need. And, and the lifestyle of people has grown to being much more active than they were when I first started the company. And you see that in everything from yoga to biking to, to kayaking to whatever. Uh, the gym time that people spend. So it's a natural that they would buy products that work functionally because more of their life is devoted to that. Yeah. Yeah. And so talking about how the company's evolved and where it is today from where it started, like looking back, what do you wish you had known uh, when you'd started the company that you know today? Well, you know, I guess I wish I'd known that what size it was going to be. I mean, we were quite happy if, if, when we got to $100 million, we thought that was a really big deal. We thought, you know, how could the market be any larger than that? And as I said, they're $3 billion now, and Patagonia is a couple billion, and Columbia is a couple billion, and and uh, and others. So didn't realize how large that was. Maybe we had a, a larger platform to be able to accomplish what we wanted than we thought. I mean, we were selling a lot of people at first who were just granola people with dirty fingernails and who like to climb or whatever. We knew we had a better idea than wilderness is a preservation of the world, but we didn't realize quite how fast and how large the market was going to be. So we could have pushed some of those ideas a little bit further. Yeah. I think, I think another thing, of course, is that we, we were an international company, but we were primarily focused on manufacturing in the U.S. while I ran the company. I, I don't think we saw or wanted it to be as global in terms of production. And maybe in today's pandemic world, there's going to be a revision of that as people start saying, you know, do we really want to have all the RN95 masks made outside of the United States? Might it be better to make them here? I don't know. But, but had we seen that it was going to be more global in terms of not only use of the product and sale of the product, but more in terms of manufacturing, we might have uh, spread out a little bit more. Yeah. And so like looking forward, you know, from today and looking forward, what are you most excited about today? Uh, disruption. As I said, I teach that at Holt. I teach one course in innovation and disruption. Uh, and there's the world is, you know, I can say it to you today is we're not knowing what is going to play out around the pandemic. But even if you get beyond the pandemic that exists right now with the coronavirus, what you're going to see is that the world is going is moving faster and faster. It's an accelerating pace of change. It's going to be disrupted by digitization, democratization, and globalization. And probably by 2030, 75% of the jobs that existed in 2000 will not exist because, they've, because of those things, digitization, democratization, globalization. And, and as a result of that, there, we're looking at a world that's constantly innovating and where it's constantly innovating, there's a chance to come up with, with really super ideas. I sit on the board of a company called Revive, and they do IV drip therapy, which is you can uh, tailor that to your needs if you want it for athletic purposes, if you want it for anti-aging, if you want it for hydration, if you want it for whatever. 
but a product which they've developed is full DNA sequencing, in which case you'll be able to sequence your DNA and then tailor, whether it's food or pharma, you can tailor a diet to what your outcome is and to what your specific needs are. For example, the Mediterranean diet works great for some people, but not for all people. And as a result, if you can tailor-made, if you can bespoke a diet based on the DNA analysis, you can do everything from gain weight to health to longevity and whatever. And you can tell with drugs whether the drugs will work or not. Chemotherapy is just a guessment by many of the doctors right now. But when you look at the DNA, you can tell whether it's going to be metabolized or not. So suddenly, this democratization of healthcare is going to be huge. And right now, 17.3% of the GDP in the United States is spent on healthcare. And this is before the issues we have in front of us right now. That is projected to grow up to at least 20%. It's about 9% in the rest of the world. 20% is not sustainable. I'm sure 9% is not sustainable. And so we're going to have to come up with ways democratize ways that are one to be able to deal with health care. First of all, on a preventative basis. And of course, I would tell people the most preventative you could have is go to the wilderness because it's good for your psyche. It's good for your health. You can hike and, and climb. You're fit mentally and physically and move ahead. But beyond that, you can do things in terms of workouts. You can do things in terms of diet. You can do things in terms of, of Tailor making where you're going to go so that you can preemptively deal with and proactively deal with your health as opposed to reactively going to see a doctor when things are ill. So I see a huge amount in healthcare. I, I suspect the first trillionaire will be out of the healthcare world just because of the amount of money that's spent on it, the crying need that exists out there for that, and all of the things that the new tools, new tech tools are going to provide. Mm. Well, as, that, that's a big world view, and, and I agree. I think things are changing rapidly, and it'll be really interesting to see where we come out on the other side of this pandemic. But you know, as you're walking down the street, or when you were allowed to, and go, going to get a coffee, and you see someone wearing a, a North Face fleece, like how does that make you feel? It generally, makes me feel good. I, you know, of course, if they're real fit and athletic, it makes me feel doubly good because that's who we targeted initially, but. I did have a laugh because I was giving a speech in uh, Copenhagen uh, last year, and I was riding in from the airport. There's a taxi driver, and he's wearing a North Face jacket. And I'm thinking to myself, I, we didn't design these things for taxi drivers. We designed them for the outdoors. And that is Hap Klopp of the North Face. If anyone can disrupt our healthcare system, I believe he can. And on a lighter note, I'm certainly happy that Pleasure Packing was a name that didn't stick. Well, that's the show. Until next time. Make sure to visit our website, www.wildstory.com, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or via RSS, so you'll never miss an episode. A lot of big stories and I cannot lie. You other storytellers can't deny. 